Today I'm going to show you how we can save multiple hours every month of standing behind a garden hose. Hi, how's it going? My name is Sebastian and in this video I'm gonna show you how I made a complete lawn irrigation system around my house. It's a great way to keep your grass green season after season while saving water and time. And this sprinkler controller is probably the most interesting element of this puzzle. It has a Wi-Fi, a touchscreen, a soap dish-like casing and a lot of bells and whistles packed inside. But before we get started, let's go back a few weeks. You have to start with planning the placement of the sprinklers and then put them in the ground. A small disclaimer, in this part I'm gonna show you what I've done at my place and what has been working for me for several weeks without any problems, but I'm by no means a specialist in this field, so if you want to be done to a T like in the wise books about irrigation, you should ask for help a certified expert or sprinkler manufacturer. Ok, let's get started. For every major project I like to start with a sheet of paper and a pen. In this case I drew a landscape of my yard with all permanent features like sidewalks. I didn't spend much time on it though. It was supposed to be a quick sketch that can be easily transferred to my CAD of choice, Fusion 360. Now it was time to exercise my brain a bit. The location of the sprinklers for optimum performance is crucial. I wanted the smallest number of sprinklers to cover the largest possible area of my lawn. What I'm about to tell you may seem controversial, but you don't need to cover 100% of the lawn. Contrary to appearances, the water travels into the soil as well. Of course, the more coverage the better, but there's no need to go crazy with it. Sometimes it's better to let go of a small spot then lay extra meters of pipes and buy additional sprinklers. I know that this is in contradiction to what you might hear from manufacturer of any system, but it's not surprising, after all, it's their paycheck. Then I started to think about the specific type and model of sprinklers. I decided to choose Rainbow 3504. They meet my requirements about radius and have good overall credentials. Important parameters that should be taken into account, except of the inlet size of course, are the range and the required water flow. This value is given in volume divided by time, for example cubic meters per hour or gallon per minute. So in order to know how many sprinklers can run at the same time, you need to know the efficiency of your water source. How to measure it without the proper equipment? It's actually quite simple. Just fill the bucket with a known capacity and measure how long it took. In my case, the 5 liter bucket fill up in 10 seconds. Let's do some math. What do we know? The volume of the bucket is 5 liters. And it took around 10 seconds to fill it up. So the water flow, let's call it F, is 5 liter per 10 seconds. Now let's replace the unit with a nicer looking liters per minute. To do this we have to divide 60 seconds by 10, which is 6. And then we can multiply it by 5 liters. So the final result is 30 liters per 1 minute. The sprinklers I've chosen needs 2 liters per minute. I'm going to use the lower end of the range, which is 4.6 meters, so I also took the lowest value of the flow rate. This means that I should be able to connect up to 15 sprinklers at the same time. On my website I've prepared a form that will calculate it for you. Link in the description. Once you enter the input values, everything will calculate itself, so you don't have to do it manually. And as you can see, the results are in line with my calculations. Additionally, you can change the units to gallons and the time span to hours if you prefer that way. Let's go back to the fusion for a moment. According to my diagram, I needed 11 sprinklers, so I could connect them all in one section. However, I didn't do it because I wanted to have a safety buffer in case of some fluctuation of the water pressure. And I wanted to have a more control over what is being watered at any given moment. In the end, I ended up with four sections. Front, side, backyard and separate one for a fruit bushes. The designing part was done. Now I had to do some work with a garden spade and dig the trenches, lay some pipes and assemble the ingrant sprinklers.
A small tip for you if you want to do something like this yourself. Do not install the sprinklers directly on this thick pipe. It makes it very difficult to set the right level afterwards. Instead, you can use a short and flexible pipe with a smaller diameter. Thanks to this, you can freely adjust the position of the sprinklers while burying it. Additionally, it's a good idea to protect the sprinkler's head against the dirt with a tin foil. All sections converge in this box with a control valves. They are responsible for physically turning the water on and off. As you can see, I use four valves because I have, surprise surprise, four sections in my system. To control them, I needed a controller. And that's why this cable is for. Speaking of which, the sprinkler controller. Some time ago, I asked you guys about your ideas and suggestions for this project. I have received many replays, for which I am very grateful. I've read them all and thought about each idea thoroughly. Most of you wanted me to add an input for a wired rain or humidity sensor, which I didn't plan to add in the first place. But thanks to you, I did it, which certainly improved the versatility of the controller. If you haven't received an email from me and you'd like to have an influence on my future projects as well, join my mailing list. The first mail you're gonna receive after opt-in will be a link to all source files of my projects, so I think it's worth it. You can find the form on my website. But let's go back to the main thread and talk about this amazing controller. As you can see it has four relays, so it can control four sections. It has LEDs, a Wi-Fi, a unique dual power supply system and a very, very drafty housing. And on top of that, it has this cool red button, which can be clicked. Cool. I'm joking, of course. This is a temporary solution that I've made to keep my lawn hydrated until I design something more serious. All right, now we can draw the PCB and solder it. Now it's good time to talk about sponsor of this project, which is JLC PCB. They made this beautiful PCB for me, like all previous ones here on my channel. I think that the best recommendation will be if I say that I would order PCBs from them even they didn't sponsor me. So with a clear conscience, I can recommend their services. For a few dollars, you'll get a professional looking PCB straight to your home in a matter of days. Link in the description. Thanks JLC PCB. Now we can talk about the details of this project. This is the power connector. You can use AC or DC in range of 6 to 32 volts. If you are using AC, the order of the wires doesn't matter. If you are using DC, theoretically the order doesn't matter either. However, if you want to bypass the rectifier and thus the voltage drop on the diodes, put the jumper here. In that case, where you want to connect the wires is key. VCC should go here and GND here. In addition, as a protection, I've placed a fuse and a varistor. If for some reason a spike of voltage appears at the input, the varistor will short the circuit and the fuse will disconnect the power. Next in line is 1 mF capacitor. Then there's a DC-DC converter that will lower the voltage to 5 volts, which is exactly what LCD and relays needs. And finally there's a LDO that reduces the voltage to 3.3 volts to power the ESP8266. The relays. Three outputs of the terminal are assigned to each of the six relays. Two of them are fully insulated, normally open contacts. You can even use them to switch the mains voltage if you want. However, if you put this jumper on, one of the outputs will be connected to the supply voltage. Most likely 24 volts AC. Thanks to this, you don't have to make additional bridges between the connectors to pass the power. 
The third output is connected to the second pole of the power supply. If you are using AC, it's a neutral or phase. If you are using VDC, it will be GND. Here are inputs for a wired humidity, rain or whatever sensor. One of them is analog and the other one is digital, plus VCC and GND. The VCC can be 3.3 or 5 volts. Just shorten the appropriate paths. If you want to use an analog sensor, you must be sure that the maximum voltage doesn't exceed 3.3 volts. That's why I put this resistor here, thanks to which you can make a voltage divider suited to your sensor. The digital input is shortened with this switch. Unfortunately, there is no free pin available in this ESP module, so we can use this button or external digital input. Never both. Fortunately, there is a display where you can make as many virtual buttons as you want. I designed it this way in case if you want to use this controller without the display. Then a mechanical button could be handy. Here is the connector for the connection display. The display on this board has STM32, which generates graphics. This makes the low-end ESP8266 chip sufficient. Otherwise, we would need at least a ESP32. Chip is connected to the display via the same UART that is used for programming. That's why it has to be done in two independent steps. But as I mentioned, this controller can function successfully without a display. If you'd like to install it in some hard to reach place, maybe there's no need to have a local interface. Then you can use the simpler version of this controller. The next step, enclosure. Now I'm gonna show you how I integrated it with Home Assistant, but of course you can use this controller with any open system. And as I mentioned earlier, the LCD and ESP8266 should be programmed separately. Let's start with an action display and nice GUI to it. GUI stands for Graphical User Interface. Luckily it isn't too complicated. The manufacturer made a nifty editor in which we can generate the firmware for the STM32 and then program it with a USB UART adapter or a microSD card. Here we can add all features, photos, buttons, text boxes and much more, and then define how they should behave. But the detailed description of the Nexion editor is out of the scope for today's video. If you'd like me to do a separate tutorial about it, let me know in the comment. On the other side are ESP8266 and ESP Home. ESP Home natively supports Nexion displays. All you have to do to establish communication with the display is configure the UART and add the component Nexion. Now, from the ESP Home standpoint, we can see all the entities we created in Action Editor. For example, a button on the display with ID1 is seen here as a classic binary sensor. And in this case, pressing it will turn on the first relay. As you can see, I turn on or off all relays locally and then just inform the Home Assistant that the switch has changed its state. Of course, you could send the information via Wi-Fi to Home Assistant that the button on the display has been pressed and then in response get information which relay should be turned on. But in case of Wi-Fi problems, it wouldn't be possible to switch any relay, which is in my humble opinion the whole point of having a local interface. Additionally, each relay is a switch, so nothing stands in the way of toggling it remotely from Home Assistant. So you can make any schedule or automation you want. The final tip, do not switch on all relays at the same time. The coil of the relay draws more current for a short moment when it's powered. Make a small shift if you want to turn on everything at once. As for the automation, there are several ways to do this. You can use Node-RED, create it directly in Home Assistant, or use ready-made components. One of them is Smart Irrigation, which looks really promising and I think it works very well. Unfortunately, I haven't used it yet but definitely I'm gonna do it. Right, it's demo time. <laughs> 